Damon Martin MMA fighting here with the president, CEO, and the man of <laughs> one championship himself, Chatri Sityotong. Chatri, welcome back. How are you? Good. How are you doing, man? I am fantastic. Thank you for taking the time. As always, I know you are one of the busiest guys in the entire world, especially in mixed martial arts. So uh, I appreciate you taking the time. Uh, obviously, one championship is busier than ever. Multiple cards already scheduled. Uh, you got to be excited just to be back in action on a full-time basis after kind of a crazy 2020. Yeah, man. I mean, uh, obviously, it's been crazy for the entire world, so we're not alone, but uh, we're just grateful that we're able to throw, you know, events week in and week out. And, uh, yeah, just super grateful for the Singapore government, super grateful to all of our athletes around the world for their patience and for their understanding. Um, you know, it's just the COVID protocols are, are pretty strict out here in Singapore. And, you know, the minute athletes land here for uh, an event, they're put strictly into a bubble uh, with the stadium and the hotel. And, and, and it's not pleasant, but, you know, they're making sacrifices for their dreams. Uh, and uh, it's, it's, it's just, yeah, I'm full of gratitude. Absolutely. Let me ask you this, Chachar. Obviously, one championship travels to a lot of different areas and everywhere in the world is a little different in terms of how they're dealing with COVID-19, some places are, you know, completely wide open. Obviously, a lot of places here in the United States were, you know, pretty much wide open for business. Uh, you know, some places are requiring masks or vaccination, things like that. But has there been any thought in terms of like traveling back out or are you content right now where you're at and just kind of waiting for things to, you know, kind of change a little bit more in certain places before you really start traveling more? Well, you know, it's it's different all over the world in terms of how governments have responded, how populations have responded. And in Asia, you know, unfortunately, we're still going through a lot of the Delta variant spikes. We're seeing record high deaths. Uh, we're seeing just the virus explode in certain countries like Japan, um, like Thailand, uh, and even China has seen some. Um, Indonesia went through a very bad spell just a few weeks ago. And so borders are closed pretty much all over the, the continent of Asia. And, um, you know, a lot of countries are still on lockdown. And so people are, are definitely struggling out here, um, a little bit different than the States. That being said, I think the world is moving in the right direction. Most countries are getting more and more of their population vaccinated um, and, and bracing for, uh, you know, the Delta variant. But of course, you know, uh, we just never know what can happen in the future. For now, we're just very grateful, appreciative. The Singapore government has really leaned in heavily created a special bubble for one. And that's why we've been able to continue events. Uh, we have not been able to continue events across Asia. Uh, since we've been back, we've only been able to do events in Thailand and China. Um, but so far this year, it's been all Singapore. Yeah. I know, obviously, we've talked before about One Championship coming here to America. You launched the, the big shows here uh, with the One Series on TNT, uh, which were which were fantastic. But but I know that and also may, I'm sure you've heard this, of course, you know, the, the Colorado Athletic Commission recently passed a rule where they would say, hey, we would allow you know the One Championship rule set, which would actually allow you guys to come here and not have to change certain things about how you guys you know, run fights. I know it's not going to happen tomorrow, but, you know, is the United States still a market you want to tackle? And does the Colorado thing maybe make it even easier to come here? Yeah. Well, you know, before COVID, our plans were to come to the U.S. Uh, on ground uh, in 2020. And obviously COVID hit and threw, you know, everything off course. And even this year, it, it has thrown everything off course. I mean, Singapore went into lockdown uh, for about two months again, you know, this earlier this year, just a, uh, a couple months ago. Um, so, you know, things are still, you know, um, stop and go uh, out here. And it's really hard for us to, to plan for the long term. But definitely, you know, the U.S. is on our radar. I don't know if you saw, but uh, we just had uh, David Levy join our board of directors. David Levy used to run Turner, uh, where he was the president and responsible for $9 billion in revenue, 6,000 employees. In fact, three and a half years ago, he was the one that signed the deal and brought one onto TNT and Bleacher. Um, and, and be our live. So, uh, and now he's joined our board uh, to help craft our U.S. strategy and our U.S. execution plan. Um, and he's been tremendous uh, for us already. Absolutely, absolutely. Let's talk about some of the fights you guys have scheduled. I know that uh, obviously with one in power coming up, you have the, the launch of the Adam Wade Grand Prix, the all women's car, which is exciting. Had a chance to talk to Elise Anderson a couple of days ago. Uh, Itsuki Harada had a chance to talk to her. This is a great tournament. I know this was delayed, originally going to kick off in March, now going to kick off in September. But how excited are you for this? Uh, 
listen, I'm a massive fan of the Grand Prix. I'm an old school Pride fan. So the the Flyway Grand Prix you guys just did was amazing. I'm really looking forward to this one, especially you know, giving the women a chance to shine. So how excited are you for this tournament? And, uh, you know, crowning a new number one contender, because listen, Angela Lee has been a phenomenal champion, uh, but this is a fantastic way to find her next opponent. Absolutely. You know, we scoured the globe for the very best uh, atom weights in the world and, uh, you know, to create this World Grand Prix. And, you know, this uh, one Empower card coming up on September 3rd is, is genuinely uh, the greatest female card in the history of martial arts uh, in terms of the level of talent, uh, even the main event, uh, having our, our one strawweight world champion, Zhong Jing Nan, defend her title against eight time Brazilian Jiu Jitsu world champion, Michelle Nicolini. And then as the Adam Wade Grand Prix, as you mentioned, um, you know, we have uh, phenomenal athletes from the States, from Ukraine, from uh, across Asia, and so it's, and, and from Brazil. And, and you know, it took a long time to, to assemble what I would call the fantastic eight. Uh, and, and I'm just so fired up. I mean, we really have an incredible lineup. And whoever wins the Grand Prix will face Angela Lee. Has there been any, because I know the delay, you know, obviously with Angela having her baby, and I know that was, you know, again, giving her the time to spend with her family and everything. Obviously, the delay in the Grand Prix, you know, kind of pushed things back a little bit. Is there a thought of Angela fighting anyone before the Grand Prix is over, or do you believe you'll get the Grand Prix done in enough time to get Angela Lee back in there on a, on a you know, somewhat normal time schedule and allow her to fight the winner of this tournament first? Right. So we should complete the Grand Prix by December of this year again, uh, barring anything that happens with COVID. Um, and then Angela Lee, uh, you know, I just spoke to her a few weeks ago. She's going to be ready by February. So actually the timing comes out perfect. Um, you know, she's uh, obviously gave birth and, and is now um, uh, playing mom and and, and uh, she's really enjoying it. And, you know, she's got to get her body back into fight shape, but um, her hunger, her fire is at all time high. I think, you know, she has something to prove to her daughter um, and, and she wants to prove to the world that, you know, being a mom, being, you know, women can be super moms. And uh, so she's going to come back and try to defend her title. But, you know, look, these eight women are genuinely the best pound for pound atom weights in the world. They just, you know, these are just phenomenal athletes, phenomenal uh, uh, martial artists. And, and um, you know, Angela has a very, very tough challenge ahead. Absolutely. Also, you guys just recently announced the One Revolution card. Uh, three different title fights on that card. Of course, I got to ask you about the lightweight title fight between Christian Lee and Ray Yun OK. Uh, that obviously, Ray Yun OK, obviously, we saw what he did in his last fight against Eddie Alvarez. Phenomenal performance. I don't think there's any giant secret why this match was made. Uh, I think we've talked before, Chachri. You probably see me talk about it online. Uh, you know, Christian Lee's one of my favorite fighters. This kid is so phenomenal. Seeing him grow up literally before our eyes at one championship and kind of crazy yeah. to see what he's done at lightweight. Uh, man, this is an interesting challenge though, but, but Christian, we got to be honest. He's kind of run through everybody's face so far at lightweight. Well, you know, I mean, like, uh, uh, uh let's see. I mean, Ray, Yoon Oak, you know, he is that, you know, dark horse, you know, I, I, most people wrote him off uh, before he faced Eddie. Right. Um, and I think even Eddie thought it was going to be an easy fight. Uh, and, but Ray, Yoon Oak is one of these really, really tough, gritty, gritty, fighters from Korea, uh, very well-rounded, um, you know, not necessarily athletic uh, or explosive in the same way Eddie Alvarez is or Christian Lee is, um, but, you know, he gets the job done. And, uh, you know, I don't think that Christian or anyone should write off uh, Ray Yoon Oak here because, uh, you know, he beat Eddie Alvarez fair and square uh, and pretty much dominated him for three rounds. And so this is a, a real title challenge. That being said, look, I think Eddie has has big things coming up again. I, you know, I, I don't believe uh, we've seen the last of Eddie. I genuinely believe, you know, uh, this loss, you know, probably uh, sparks uh, a big fire in his belly. And look, at the end of the day, Eddie wants to win the one world title so that he can say he's the only man on earth to have ever won all the three major global organizations, one UFC and Bellator. Yeah, uh, obviously, Christian has you know become one of the faces of one championship. And again, when you sign a fighter at that young of an age, you never know exactly what's going to happen. You know, obviously, they got to develop and evolve. But we always have these pound for pound debates in mixed martial arts. Some people like them. Some people hate them. Uh, again, it's kind of hard to judge because it depends on what you're judging. Are you judging you know, the talent of the weight class? Are you judging like kind of the, the fantasy matchmaking, how they do it, like a certain weight, all those kind of questions. But 
Uh, I truly believe Christian Lee is one of the best pound for pound fighters in our sport, whether we're talking about lightweight, featherweight, whatever. Uh, I, I imagine you agree, but it's kind of crazy to see how this run he's currently been on. Uh, I could just say that you're a smart man. <laughs> you know, I would put Christian Lee against any lightweight in the world, full stop. Um, you know, I don't want to name names, but, you know, obviously Hawaii is a hotbed of MMA. He's trained with some of the best athletes from all the organizations in the world. He smokes them all in the training room. I've seen him uh, again um, train with elite, elite, top of the top level UFC and Belter athletes, and run through them. And and so you know, um, and obviously, you, w- w- look w- w- when he's in action, you can see he, he's uh, explosive. He's good everywhere, and he's just highly unpredictable. And he's again only. 21 22 i mean just crazy stuff right so he uh he has the whole world ahead of him and and uh you know yeah he grew up when he joined he was 17 he was a kid he didn't know what he was doing and, and today again he's maturing in, in, into uh, you know a full-grown adult and uh, actually he's a dad as well now and uh yeah i think christian has a tremendous future ahead of him actually, absolutely i think he's 23, I think he's 23. <laughs> Yeah, it's kind of crazy. You think about how young he started with 16. So, yeah, he's like literally been – he literally grew up in front of our eyes and won championship. Right. Uh, you mentioned you mentioned it there, Chantry. Let me just go ahead and segue to that and ask you about Eddie Alvarez because, listen, when you sign fighters, you know, there's there's all – you know, there's all manner of things that can happen. Obviously, you're going to sign some people who are going to come in and they're going to, you know, set the world on fire, and you're going to have some other people come in and struggle. And we got to be honest, Eddie has struggled in a lot of ways. I mean, that's not a knock on him. I think it's just a – a credit to the talent in one championship. When you hear Eddie talk about it, you hear anybody who's gone over to one championship and fought, they've said, you listen, we're just facing great competition. There's no shame in losing to Ray, you know, or losing to, uh, yeah. you know, uh, Timothy Nostiukin, but obviously you make an investment in a guy like Eddie Alvarez. You expect big things out of him. So kind of give me your thoughts on like where Eddie's at and, and, and where yeah. he goes from here, because so, he's had, he's had a bit of a tough run. Yeah. So we made, you know, we made an investment in several UFC superstars, like Sage, like Eddie, like DJ, uh, you know, Yushin Okami, you know, a bunch of, of UFC guys. And, you know, they've all gotten knocked out, um, a rude awakening. Um, and I think it's just a testament to the level. You know, I, I genuinely believe that the best roster in the world is one and UFC, depending on the weight class, right? I do believe that UFC has better heavy heavyweight classes, so the heavyweight, light heavyweight divisions. But I genuinely believe lightweight and below, one would dominate uh, any organization in the world. And uh, we're seeing that, you know, we're seeing that. So, um, you know, I know the American media in America, you know, in the States obviously covers UFC a lot, the MMA media. So American fans have a have a perspective that, you know, UFC is the only thing in MMA because it's in America. Um, and obviously UFC has events in America. But the reality is there's four and a half billion people out here in Asia. You know, almost everyone does martial arts. And so the, the, the talent pool that we can select from out here is is tremendous. But of course, you know, we scour the globe uh, for the very, very best talent, just like UFC or Bellator does. Um, and, you know, uh, on any given day, I, I, it's, I, I think it's a, it's a toss up. And I think we're seeing that uh, whenever athletes cross over from different organizations, they don't necessarily do well. But I mean, look, I still love Eddie. I still love uh, Sage. I, I still love DJ. Look, I love all these guys. And, and I think the investment will pay off. Um, you know, they are amongst the best in the world and, and with a bright future. Um, it, it's just, you know, Eddie's joined a division that's murderer's row. Uh, and he's going to have to get through all those guys in order to get a title shot. And, but at the same time, Eddie wouldn't have it any other way. You know, he, he wants to prove that he's the best in the world still. You know, uh, I think when he left the UFC, he was number four or number three or something like that. Um, he still has it. Uh, so, um, yeah, I mean, look, I think fans will always, you know, uh, uh, debate, you know, who's the best champion at which division or who's the best pound for pound, um, you know, all over the world. Just And the number one question I probably get from fans is would you ever do a, a one versus UFC event? And, you know, I've always said, definitely, I would love to see it. You know, it would be a global mega event of epic proportions. If you think about it, we have a dominant uh, viewership share out here in Asia. UFC has a dominant viewership share, uh, you know, in the Western hemisphere, kind of a East versus West. Although both organizations are truly global, I would say, you know, it's not really East versus West, but anyways, it would just make a fun storyline, right? Uh, in terms of viewership. So 
Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And like I said, I mean, Eddie is Eddie is a legend. Eddie has fought the best of the best. Have you talked to Eddie in terms of when he's going to come back, what kind of matchup you're looking at for him? Because he's already fought a lot of the good guys in the lightweight division. Obviously, I know, you know, the Lapicus fight can be run back. I know that had an unfortunate ending to that fight. So is there any thought about what is next for Eddie? Well, you know, look, again, Eddie lost to Ray Yoon Oak fair and square, but Ray Yoon Oak is, is, is legit. You know, it's, it's not like he lost to, 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 to you know, uh, some, you know, uh, you know, athlete with a horrible record or an athlete who just had subpar skills. He lost fair and square to an outstanding fighter. So I, I still think Eddie's in the mix. You know, I think he's one or two wins away. If, if, if he, if he dominates his next fight, you know, I'd like to probably put him up against uh Doggy, uh, who's the number one contender right now, um, you know, is the number one on the rankings in, at one in the, in the lightweight division um, or something like that. You know, put, give Eddie another uh, good opponent that if he wins, it paves his way to a title shot. But, you know, Doggy, Doggy, he wants his uh, revenge match against Christian. You know, he, he lost to Christian um, uh, a couple of years ago and he wants his uh, he, he wants his title shot. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so let me ask you. Right. That'll be a fun fight. Absolutely. Absolutely. You mentioned it earlier, talking about some of the U.S. athletes you brought over. Demetrius Johnson is another case, obviously one of the pound for pound greats of all time. Uh, there's absolutely no shame whatsoever in losing to Adriana Marias. I think Adriana is the top flyweight in the sport. Now, you don't knock out Demetrius Johnson and not become the best flyweight in the world. He's a tremendous fighter, and I think he's kind of coming into his own uh, when you look at what he's doing right now. And I talked to Demetrius uh, maybe a couple months ago, and he said, listen, I'm fine working my way back. I lost. I lost fair and square. I have no problem working my way back but when i talked to adriano he said listen i you know i demetrius is the greatest of all time i'll ad- happily give him an automatic rematch where do you sit on that on that fence uh you know in, in terms of what's next for those guys because demetrius says i'll work my way back but the champ is saying hey listen he's a legend i'll give him a rematch well you know i think it's kind of ironic that dj you know, the rule set of one is different, obviously, than the rule set of UFC. Um, one could say, you know, against the ha- uh, hardcore MMA fans would say that one's real, uh, one's rule set is more real because we allow knees on the ground and, 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 and we now, you know, 12 to 6 elbows and stuff like that. Real martial arts. And I think for DJ to get knocked out by something that I think a couple weeks earlier he'd said, I think I forget it was Peter Yan versus uh, Aljamain, and there was an illegal knee, which is legal in, in, in one. Illegal in the UFC, UFC, but legal in one. And uh, so there's kind of like an irony there. Um, you know, I'd like to see them run it back. Again, I, I still believe, DJ's 35 years old, I still believe he is in the prime of his career. I still believe he is the GOAT. He is definitely the GOAT. I mean, you know, I'm lifelong martial arts. I don't judge the GOAT just from your record, but obviously your skill level and who you fought and how many times you were able to uh, defend your title. But if you just look at raw skill set, and I think Joe Rogan just said this uh, a week ago or a few days ago that, you know, he thought DJ was the the GOAT in terms of skill set. As a lifelong martial artist, if you just look at what he's able to do and how he's able to dominate his division, uh, you know, when he was at UFC and even won, he, he ran through everyone and won the Grand Prix. Um, he is the goat man. And, and so Adriano is, so, so, uh, you know, that being said, you know, is Adriano the best flyweight in the world or is DJ, you know, I would say Adriano is right now because Adriano dominated DJ, but you know, I, I'd love to see them running back. I mean, DJ is one of these guys that he learns from experience and he, and he gets better and better. And he's still in the prime of his life. I mean, if you just look at the past few years, right, he's only fought a couple times a year, even, even when he's at the, I think the last few years of his UFC career, he was only fighting twice a year. His body is, is not doesn't have a lot of wear and tear. And his style, too, if you think about it, it's not like he's been knocked out 10 times, right? He doesn't DJ has a style that that, that has longevity behind it. You know, it's all you know, styles really make make for, for for you know how much wear and tear you have on your body. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh speaking of guys uh wanting to come to one championship because of what you guys are doing over there. Uh, a guy by the name of Dan Hardy, former UFC welterweight title contender. I had a chance to talk to him a couple of weeks ago. I know he's been doing a little bit of analyst work, things like that for one championship. And he said, you know, he's obviously wanting to come back. He wants to fight again. And he told me flat out one championship is where I want to fight. I love what they do there. And he loves that you give him options in terms of 
being able to potentially fight in kickboxing. I know he talked about maybe fighting John Wayne Parr. Also, obviously, he still wants to do mixed martial arts, so he could cross over and do that. And you give that option in one championship, which no other organization in the world can do that. I'm curious your interest in Dan Hardy. Is that a guy you'd be interested in signing? And is that a possibility you would uh, you would want him fighting in one championship? You know, I never say never. I am a Dan Hardy fan. I, um, you know, I still love, you know, when I think back all his fights, uh, you know, I, I, I watch his fights. He, he's, he's game. He's, he's very exciting. Um, but, you know, he hasn't fought in a few years, and I think he might be almost 40 years old. So, you know, I'm not, like, really excited by the idea. Um, but I, I am a Dan Hardy fan, and I think he will bring it. But, you know, I think he has some medical condition. He has, you know, so it's still, like, I'm not, like, you know, jumping up and down for that, you know, to sign Dan. I am a Dan Hardy fan. I think he's a good person and I think he's a good fighter. I just, he hasn't fought for so long. And, you know, I, I don't know, you know, I, I'd have to talk to my team. Um, my, my, I know my team is mixed. Some people say, yeah, let's do it. Some people say, nah, it's, it's, it, it doesn't do anything. Yeah, understandable, understandable. To that point, though, a guy that I'm quite sure you would work with if the ever if the opportunity ever came about is former UFC heavyweight champion Stephen Miocic. Now I know you saw when you put up the thing about you know what free agent should one championship sign next. Stipe, you know, was the one who responded. I know Arjun Buller got excited. Now again, I know Stipe is still under contract to the UFC, and it seems like he's a bit unhappy with what's going on right now in terms of where he comes back and gets a title shot. What's going on in division? And again, listen, I understand fighters are gonna you know do these kind of things to stir up attention. I get it, but I thought it was interesting that Stipe did that. Now I don't think there's any any secret that if he became available i'm sure you would gladly work with steve miocic but is it is it fun or is it you know kind of gratifying to see a fighter of that caliber arguably one of the greatest heavyweights of all time if not the greatest heavyweight of all time you know when that comes up he, he he's looking at one championship as a legitimate option for him yeah look I, I mean i think that that story has been done already in the, in the sense of if you want to fight the very very best in the world i think there's two options it's one or ufc and, you know, it depends on, on, on your own personal preferences. I, I think out here we have a lot of strikers. Uh, you know, I think that was the, the, the biggest remark that DJ had was, you know, everyone here has been striking since they're three years old. On Converse in the U.S., you know, people have been wrestling since they're three years old, like, like, like a Henry Cejudo or, you know, many, many of the, uh, you know, Daniel Cormier, et cetera. So it's kind of funny. So you do see the style differential um, between the two organizations. Um, and, and, uh, look, I, I, I love Stipe as well. He's, he's obviously uh, a phenomenal heavyweight, um, who got clipped. Um, but you know, I, 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 it's, it's, um, it's, uh, unless he's really a free agent, there's no point in discussing, right. I, I think, uh, you know, UFC does a great job, um, in, in keeping its, 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 uh, top athletes happy. Um, and, and I'm sure, uh, Stipe and, and UFC will work it out. Now, if they don't work it out and he ends up being a free agent, yeah, of course, uh, I'd love to talk to Stipe. Absolutely. To that point, your heavyweight champion, Arjun Bular, a uh, huge win for him. He seems like a star on the rise. Of course, I know that one championship had really targeted India as a big area of expansion. Unfortunately, again, with COVID, we know what happened. It's going to slow down those, pro those that process. But Arjun has been a great fighter for you guys. And I know Arjun told me when I spoke to him after his big win becoming champion, he said, he would love to cross over and do some professional wrestling. You guys obviously have the partnership with TNT. AEW is great for them. That's a huge organization. I'm curious because I hear different things from different promoters. Some promoters say, hey, focus on your fight career. Worry about professional wrestling or whatever else you want to do when it's all over. But Arjun is a, is a potentially a huge star and already a huge star in a lot of ways in terms of uh, his growth and his expansion now that he's champion. So where do you lie in that argument, Chacha? Because obviously you want to get the most out of Arjun as a fighter, but you know him showing up and, and doing some pro wrestling, I mean, that only raises his, his level of interest from the American audience, from a global audience at large. So I'm kind of curious where you, where you sit on Arjun, allowing Arjun to go do professional wrestling. So my philosophy is I, I try my best to, to work with our athletes uh, in terms of what they want to achieve in, in their own careers. I mean, you know, um, so I have had talks with uh, Arjun's managers about, you know, WWE and AEW and stuff. Um, I don't know if those conversations panned out from their side, from WWE's side. I think um, maybe Arjun, if, if he defends a few more times and a few more times and becomes a, a bonafide megastar in India, 
then I think maybe WWE or AEW would be more interested. Um, but I'm open, you know, to, I, I just, I, I just try my best to support our athletes, our champions in a way that, you know, what they want to do. So for example, DJ has talked about wanting to do crossover fights. I will support it. You know, um, you know, as you, you know, Damon, uh, you know, in, in one, we've held boxing world title fights. We've had Muay Thai, we have kickboxing, we have submission grappling, we have MMA. So, you know, it's, it's a true martial arts platform that if you want to experiment or you want to try to dominate multiple sports, uh, we've actually had some champions who are, who've been dominated two or three sports, right. Uh, within the one platform. So, um, you know, I, I try my best. I mean, I don't think we would ever do professional wrestling in one though, but, um, we may, you know, I mean, uh, I'm supportive of, of Arjun chasing his dreams in, in WWE and AEW for sure. Absolutely. We've talked about a lot of divisions before I get you out of here, Chantry. Obviously, uh, one division I had to, I have to ask you about is the uh, the one bantamweight division. Obviously, John Lineker has come over and done some great things since you guys signed him. Uh, it seems like he's the number one contender, but I didn't realize this until I looked at the calendar. You know, Bibiana Fernandez has been out for almost two years at this point. I had heard some rumors about, you know, some contract discussions. I'd heard that maybe he offered to step in and fight recently, maybe not. I don't know. Like I said, I figured I'd just ask you, what's going on with Bibiano, and is there a plan or a course of action to getting him back in you know sooner rather than later because i believe october will be two years since he's fought right so i i think my team uh has a call with him next week i believe uh i'm not really close to that situation i know that there have been a little bit of uh a friction on, on the contract side of things and um i think uh bibiano's manager is trying to uh, uh get a um a renewal going um, and so I know the team has been negotiating, that both sides have been negotiating um, for a better part of the 12 months. But I think, I think, you know, 12 months of it was probably COVID and another 12 months of it is just, you know, um, Bibiano's manager has been, you know, you know, talking to our team about a new contract. And, and uh, I think we're far apart on numbers, you know, on a personal level. Look, I, I love Bibiano. Uh, he's a phenomenal guy with incredible life story. And obviously, I, I still believe that he is one of the best in the world. Um, you know, if you just look at his body of work, his career, um, he's just phenomenal. Obviously, a multiple-time BJJ world champion, but, you know, fought in Dream and, 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 and all the different organizations. And then, you know, uh, was a is a dominant champion in one. Um, you know, these things get in the way. They do. It, it's just it happens in the UFC. It happens in Bellator where, look, we, we try our best to have a win-win approach. We try our best to have... Um, you know, try to meet our athletes, you know, um, and, and, you know, where they see their value. And we try our best, like, you know, nothing's going to ever be perfect. I think it's just like, you know, any workplace in the world, you know, you're, people are going to always want raises and, and some bosses believe the way raises are warranted and some people don't believe it's warranted. So, you know, it's not really just even about UFC or one or Bellator. It really is about, you know, any job in the world, like Damon, I'm sure you'd love a raise too, right? You know, I mean, just everybody, right? Uh, you know, so so, but sometimes these discussions get heated, and 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 sometimes people take it personally and, and stuff. But I mean, I have not been involved in in the discussions at all. Um, so my team has been involved in that, um, but I believe next week is, is is when we're supposed to talk, and they've actually wrote me in. So I believe I'm supposed to talk to Bibi with our team and, and Bibi and his team uh, next week. But you know, I'd love to see Bibi on back in action, but. Look, if 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 the demands are are are, are you know too aggressive, it it, it just uh, it doesn't make sense, right? So. Yeah. Is that a point where, and I don't want to make it, you know, like a, you know, uh, you know, like a, a life or death situation here, but you know, obviously you're going to have a conversation next week, but is there a point where one championship would have to consider moving on or maybe crowning an interim champion? Because obviously you don't want to leave that division in limbo forever. And I know COVID again, you know, pushed everything back a little bit right there. But like I said, I mentioned John Lineker has been such an incredible fighter since coming in. I know he really, really wants a title shot. Obviously you don't want to hold the division up forever. No. Yes. Uh, yes. So again, I think, Next week will be a very serious conversation about, look, if Bibiano wants to continue as champion, we will support him with, you know, a certain economic package. If he doesn't want to, then, you know, who knows? We may, we may end up parting ways. I, I really don't know. Like, I'm not as close to the situation uh, as my team is. Um, so I'll find out more next week. Um, but of course, you know, I'd love Bibiano to, you know, for Bibiano to end his career at one and, 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 and everyone be happy. 
Uh, that's my ultimate goal. But, you know, at the same time, I have to do something that my team believes makes sense. I mean, you know, at the end of the day, um, you know, I try to make it so that everyone wins. The athlete wins, the manager wins, and and, and one wins, right? And, and if you're able to create economic packages that everyone feels good about and everybody wins, then you're able to move forward together. But when you're way far apart, it's hard. It's hard. Sure. Understandable. Uh, real quick, another guy that mentioned recently about potentially coming to one championship, you guys, because you guys do so many different things in terms of MMA, grappling matches, all these different things, is a guy in Damian Maya. Now, Damian has said he only wants to fight one more time and call it a career, but he said he dreamed of fighting in Asia, dreamed of fighting in Japan. I know you're not going to Japan right away, <clears throat> excuse me, because of the COVID situation, but uh, is Damian Maya, like, would you ever work with a guy like that in terms of, like, he wants one more fight, he wants to go out, he wants to do that, you know, and, and, and I know, like, you respect true martial artists, I don't know that there's a, a more admirable martial artist in the sport than a guy like Damian Maya, one of the best people I've ever talked to in this industry. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Damian Maya is a class act. I mean, we have friends in common, uh, obviously, you know, uh, one of the most decorated jiu-jitsu world champions and, and, you know, had a very good run in the UFC, you know, I think he's like 41, 42 now. So, um, you know, again, I, it's kind of like, like the similar to a Dan Hardy situation, like, it's not like I'm jumping up and down for it, you know, under the right circumstances, we might do it, but it's not like, you know, we, we, for us, we're always just trying to find the very, very best in the world, the be very best rising stars that, you know, across all the multiple sports, whether it's MMA or Muay Thai or Jiu Jitsu or um, boxing, et cetera. And we're just trying to find the very, very best athletes um, or people that we believe can become the very best in the world. And, and we're not really into, you know, I, I know Bellator is more into, you know, um, signing, you know, um, the legends or the past, you know, I, that's not really one's model. One's model is really about finding the very, very best talent or people that we believe, athletes that we believe can genuinely be the best in the world. So, you know, Damien doesn't fit that box. Dan Hardy doesn't fit that box. It doesn't mean that we wouldn't do it. I, you know, we have done legend versus legend fights like Henzo Gracie, uh, versus Yuki Kondo, we did that kind of like a, a throwback to the pride days. Um, but it'd have to be very special. So I, I, again, like I'm not jumping up and down to sign Damien. Uh, although again, like I think, yeah, what you said, Damien's right. He's a, he, he, Damien is a phenomenal guy and, and, and a tremendous athlete, but it's just, he's at the tail end of his career. Yeah, understandable. Real quick before I get you out of here, you guys just recently signed a new executive to join one championship, a guy by the name of Michael Mansory, who a lot of people in the United States don't know by name, but by reputation. He previously worked at WWE. Uh, I know he's going to be working with your live production team. Now, I've always said one of the things I love most about one championship is you guys make the entire production a show, which I enjoy. It's one thing that's been taken out of a lot of the American productions, you know, guys just walk into the ring and that's it. You guys put some pageantry, some promotion behind the introductions and the video packages. And I just, it gets, it gets us excited. It gets, it's fun. I mean, listen, we, we're all there for the martial arts aspect, but why not have fun doing it? And I was kind of curious about bringing him in and, and I know he's going to be doing work with your live production side. Uh, I'm kind of curious because obviously WWE is kind of what I'm talking about. You know, they kind of put the show behind the, the actual you know action in terms of what they do. You guys are kind right. of already doing that. So I kind of imagine this is a perfect fit. Yeah. I, I mean, look, we scour the globe for every position, especially every leadership position. We scour the globe for the very, very best. We don't look for the best in Singapore or the best in Asia. You know, I genuinely scour the world's best. And Mike Mansuri was the VP of global TV production uh, at WWE, you know, he was reporting to Kevin Dunn, who's been a long time, you know, a lieutenant of, of Vince McMahon. Um, and he spent uh, 11 and a half years, uh, you know, cutting his teeth. You know, he's joined as a junior editor and he rose all the way to the top of VP of global TV production. Um, and he's joining uh, one of his former WWE colleagues, John Scheller, who was a senior vice president of events, production and talent at WWE as well, where he was there for five years. So they worked together for five years. Um, you know, on the main product, live broadcast product of, of WWE. And um, one thing I really respect about WWE, although it is completely 180 degrees different from what we do, like at one or at UFC, you know, ours is uh, ours is a real sport. Ours is live and real. Um, you know, WWE is obviously live scripted. So it's a little bit different. But 
in terms of production value, like, you know, I have a lot of respect for WWE. I have a lot of respect for Vince and, and, and Triple H and, you know, um, you know, the phenomenal uh, leadership team at, at WWE. They've always built something very special and um, their shows are spectacular. So we wanted to, you know, keep raising the bar. You know, uh, people say our show already, as you said, is, um, you know, one of the world's best, if not the world's best. Um, and obviously completely different from what you see, you know, in the U.S. for U.S. promotions. Um, but there's always room for improvement. There's always ways to elevate the game and raise the bar. And I think bringing in, um, you know, uh, two important leaders from the WWE leadership team into one, you know, they're both moving to Singapore. Uh, actually, John Scheller has already moved to Singapore uh, with his family and his three ch- and his three kids. And Mike is moving over here uh, imminently uh, uh, with his uh, girlfriend. Awesome. Awesome. Last thing, Chacha, I'll get you out of here on this. You know, you mentioned it before. You believe in your 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 heart and your soul is sold that when we talk about the best promotions in the world, it really comes down in terms of talent to two organizations, the UFC and one championship and what you guys are building. And listen, I know you have a, a lot of respect for everybody else out there. Scott Coker, Bellator, I'm sure at PFL, things like that. But one thing you've mentioned over and over and over again, and, and you mentioned Demetrius as well, is like the possibility of doing some crossover fights. Now, we've heard this a lot, and you've thrown down the challenge. You were more than happy to put the best of one championship against the best from any other organization in the world. But outside of a couple of occasions where that's happened, it just really hasn't happened because a lot of promotions, I feel like, you know, I understand the money. I get the money aspect. You know, they don't want to, you know, share money with anybody, uh, but also they don't want to take a chance on their champion losing. They don't want their champion to lose to the one champion, and then their champion looks bad. But do you believe we'll ever see this, even if it's just a one-off? Like, will we ever see a cross-promotion? Because obviously you're open to it, and you've been very, very, you know, open about doing it. I think Scott Coker's mentioned, you know, maybe doing some cross-promotion, but again, I don't know how much of that's just lip service, but... Do you think we'll ever see it? Will we ever get to see like the best of one championship against the best of another organization? Well, well you know, the, the, the way I do, it's, I, I do believe it's possible, but I think both sides have to win and both sides have to gain something. Um, and so that it becomes a win-win. And I don't know if you saw the, the, the recent Nielsen industry report on the, on the biggest global sports properties uh, a couple months ago, came, that Nielsen came out on, you know, with it. And by far the two biggest um, combat sports promotions are UFC and one in terms of TV viewership and, and digital and social metrics and all that. I mean, we are, uh, you know, top 10 in the world um, by all the different metrics. And, and so I, my team is game. We would love to, our athletes are game. Um, it, it really, the, the ball really is in uh, UFC's court. Absolutely. Well, Chatri, keep doing the good work you're doing. I love what you guys are doing at One Championship. you got a lot of big shows coming up here in September. I'm very much looking forward to those. Looking forward to what you guys do for the rest of this year. I uh, can't say thank you enough. I know you're one of the busiest guys in the industry, so I can't say thank you enough for taking this time to speak with me and kind of give me an update on everything you guys are working on, everything you guys are doing. Uh, thank you for the time. Best of luck in the shows coming up. And uh, I'll say it like I say, I think every time we talk, I look forward to One Championship coming to America because uh, I can't wait for the day I can actually attend and go to a One Championship show here in the states man thank you so much i, I really appreciate kind words damon and, and i love your work as well so uh keep on shining keep on uh you know uh blowing up mma all over the world i appreciate it man